So I cannot compete with Gershwin and a wonderful pianist, uh, but I want to talk to my friends in German chemistry. First of all, I am so happy to join you in this celebration of 150 years of the Gesellschaft Deutscher Chemiker. It's an auspicious occasion, truly a time to celebrate. Now, my association with Germany spans half the life of the GDCH, which only testifies to my age. The beginning of that connection, as you heard, was difficult, as many of you know. Those were the times, Nazi times, and we were its victims. May they never happen again. In the context of German chemistry, we owe a debt to the late Lothar Jenike, to historians Ute Deichmann, and especially Helmut Meyer, for putting before us the fates of good Germans who suffered, the extent of participation of the German chemical establishment in the realization of the NSDAP schemes before and during the war, and the seductive selective amnesia once World War II was over. But back to me, things improved, and I progressed from reading my first stories of chemists in German at age 10 in a refugee camp in Wasseralfingen by Ahlen, and that these stories were of a Polish chemist who emigrated to France, Marie Curie, or of a black American agricultural chemist, George Washington Carver. Maybe that has something to do with what I'm going to tell you today. I progressed, I progressed to being uh, an immigrant to America and new to my sixth language, English, and on to becoming, almost by accident, a chemist um, and writing and reading about much more than chemistry. Remarkably, as my research interests evolved from theoretical to organic, uh, from inorganic to organic to solid state chemistry, whatever I worked on seemed somehow hot in German chemistry. Somehow there was a synchrony of the chemical imagination between what interested me and what German chemists were working on. Perhaps the early tie that R.B. Woodward and I forged with Angevante Chemie contributed. But in the end, all relations are personal. And the 20-odd German young people, postdoctoral students, and a few senior visitors who have over the years been with me at Cornell who made, they were the ones who made that connection strong and lasting. Some are in the audience today. I love you, for you have not only uh, helped me, but you have led me to fields that I could not imagine I would ever be working in. Whatever the reason is, I'm with you, my German friends, in mind and in spirit, 
And so I congratulate the GDCH for reaching this milestone. And I'm so happy to be in it. Now, I want to talk to you about diversity. I take a risk in that, to speak of diversity, because diversity is a concept with many meanings. The risk is that the word has not only scientific, but also socio-political connotations. And I do not avoid the socio-political ones. Uh, how can I? I choose to begin with the positive connotation of the term diversity because I, a survivor of the Holocaust, am an optimist about human nature, as Primo Levi was. It is a mark of our universal reach for a just and livable society that today, simple mention of diversity evokes a renewed commitment to democracy. In that word, diversity, is the desire that all people encounter fair opportunities, a distinct respect for minority opinion, and beyond that, a real valuation of the way biologically and culturally evolved diversity enriches both the world and our individual lives. At the same time, the idea of diversity for some has become a code word for something they feel distinctly uncomfortable with, a threat of some unfair entitlement of pushy people trying to get something that they could not get on their own merits. We have to face that potentially negative term, sense of the word, whether it applies to preferences for scheduled cases in India, admissions to American universities, or mandated gender equality in legislatures around the world. In this lecture, I will begin by looking at the many ways of diversity in science. I will argue from its societal meaning that diversity is an expression of one of the great dualities or polarities of this world, that of similarity and difference, of the same and not the same. I will look at how diversity comes up naturally in science, especially chemistry, and how it remains lacking even as we make progress in the people who do science. And I will argue on both philosophical and social grounds for the value of diversity in science, in its practitioners, and in society. Now, first of all, it's natural. In biology and chemistry, diversity are omnipresent, the result of natural workings of combinatorics physical constraints and human desires in chemistry, the same factors in biology, tremendously enriched by the grand scheme of evolution, as I will try to show you. So the building blocks of chemistry are a few, a hundred elements or so. Isn't that enough variety? No. The chemistry that runs our bodies needs more than a hundred different things. The chemical universe develops from the persistent yet mutable existence under ambient terrestrial conditions of groupings of atoms called molecules. The rules of how atoms bind together, uh, my specialty, have an influence on what could be built, but realistically the rules constrain in only a minor way a combinatorial explosion, a cornucopia of structures and function that's delimited only by our imagination. It's, it's like the mechano sets of our childhood. The building blocks may be few, but there is no limit to what a child can build with them. Now, we are those children. We delight in what we can do. And what we can do 
can be sold, actually, which means that it is useful. The compounds we make transform the world. Let it be for the good. The combinatorics of chemistry clearly guarantees diversification. If you consider the simple group of saturated hydrocarbons, uh, I'm sorry for the organic chemistry. Uh, there are unique combinations of one, two, and three carbons and the requisite number of hydrogens. But for more carbons, the number of possibilities increases. It grows slowly at first, so there are just three combinations for five carbons and 12 hydrogens, the three isomers of pentane. But then it grows fast. For 30 carbons, there is four billion isomers. Now imagine the possibilities in a molecule the size of hemoglobin with 2,954 carbons and a good number of other atoms. And yet, uh, this is the one that is somehow chosen by evolution. The complexification that's allowed by the phenomena of isomerism, the richness that results, has biological consequences. And sometimes only one atom matters. Here is a case. Uh, uh, pseudoephedrine, the molecule at left, a, a useful anti-congestant. It only takes the removal of one atom uh, to make methamphetamine a dangerous drug, a process that is all too easy, even for non-chemists. Perhaps this is the place to mention uh, the insight of Primo Levi and his beautiful prose, which has been evoked a few times. Levy was a chemist as well, and a writer. Uh, here is, I think, a posed picture, not a realistic one of him in his laboratory, because it's much too clean, OK? <laughs> I think what happened is someone wanted to, to pose him as a chemist, so they put him into a clean laboratory. Uh, but he was perfectly willing to do this. Uh, he, uh, in the periodic table, in the potassium chapter, he needs, uh, Levy becomes disappointed, as many young people are with his analytical chemistry. He complains, why are there no theorems of chemistry? And in order to, to overcome that, he decides he has to go to the physics department. And there he begins work with a person who became a well-known astrophysicist. And he is set to dry some equipment, a rather chemical task. And he makes a mistake of using uh, potassium instead of sodium to do this. And here is what he writes about it. And I will read it in the third language in which we are hearing Primo Levi tonight, uh, not nearly as beautiful as the Italian. I thought of another moral, and I believe that every militant chemist can confirm it, that one must distrust the almost same, the practically identical, the approximate, the or even all surrogates and all patchwork. The differences can be small, but they can lead to radically different consequences. Like a railroad switch points, the chemist trade consists in good part in being aware of those differences, knowing them close up and foreseeing their effects. And not only the chemist trade. I am grateful to the German and Italian chemical societies for awarding to me the first Primo Levi Award of both societies. Uh, Primo's inherent humanism in surviving and overcoming his way with words and stories has been truly an inspiration to me. But let me return to chemical diversity a little bit. As a result of the workings of evolution, anything natural is dirtier than anything synthetic. Just to give you an example, 
Here is, in the next slide, the beginnings of a list of the ingredients of the aroma of a good Frankenwein, okay? There is nine hills in that list. And they are there for good reason, and they are what distinguishes that wine from another wine. So I could give you more examples, but perhaps that is enough, and I have to now move a little bit in the other direction, because what I have said is too simple. Because it's not only diversity, diversity does reign supreme in chemistry, and yet, and yet things are not so simple. Diversity, or being the same, not the same, in rather, in science or in society, is actually part of a tension that chemistry plays out uh, all the time, a polarity in which being the same and not the same, each have their value. So let's talk about the value of conserving a property, um, the value of homogeneity, the value of maintaining stability of relationships between compounds, of homeostasis. And I want to move beyond the simple prejudice that we have for dealing with pure compounds. It is clear in chemistry that compounds come in families with a gradation of properties, physical, chemical, and biological across the series, and what matters is as much the, rela the relation as the variation. Uh, by way of example, here are four uh, hormones active in determining gender differences, two male and two female. You will see that they are different. You have to look very fast, and if you are a chemist, you will be able to perceive the differences. They look generally the same, but they are different chemically. Now, what is, interested is interesting is that they are intimately related in the way that the body makes them. Now, the next slide is terrible because it's complex, but I'll tell you what's in it. It's a slide that shows the relationship between various steroidal hormone components in the biosynthesis in the body, as they are made from cholesterol, which is not a bad molecule, it's a good molecule. Um, and they are all made eventually from cholesterol. And what's interesting is, at least here, I've circled three of the molecules. And you'll have to believe me if you can't read the labels that the top one is progesterone, one of the female sex hormones, and down below it, straight below it, is testosterone, one of the male hormones, and to the right of it is estradiol, another one of the female hormones. And now I will just circle in blue arrows, which you cannot see, which show where these are, come from, how they are made in the body. And the point is, that the male sex hormone is made from a female one and in turn is transformed into a female one. And that they are intimately related to each other by their relationship, even as their differences matter and matter a lot. Let me give you another example, which is a sto a, a, another biochemical story. In the halcyon days of pheromone chemistry, so insects are the greatest chemists in the world. They communicate by rather simple chemistries. And um, I have colleagues, Jerry Meinwald and the late Tom Eisner, who are experts in this. This does not come from their work. In the early days of pheromone chemistry, people were so happy when they isolated a molecule which was the sex attractant in, of, uh, of a particular organism. In this case, the organism is a cabbage looper moth, which is uh, an agricultural pest. It is shown at left in its mature stage, and at right it is shown in the caterpillar stage, 
and below it is the molecule which was first isolated for a pheromone, rather interestingly looking very much like the caterpillar stage of, of, the, of, the, um, of the moth. People were so happy, but with time it became clear that things were not so simple. And Wendell Roloffs, who was studying this, this is from his paper, it's a complicated slide, but I can tell you what's on it. What he does is an analysis of the way that that fatty acid is made in the moth. And it turns out it's made by elaborating a chain by a sequence of very well characterized organic reactions. And in that chain, there are, in that process of being made, there are other molecules, and one axis in the above rectangular graph is uh, the axis of the length of the number of carbons in the chain. And the other axis just labels where is the double bond. And taking six of these molecules, uh, they were able to uh, get a much better attractant uh, for the poor, hapless male of the species, uh, which would then start its courting flights. Um, clearly, one needs six for sex. And would a human perfumer be surprised that you need more than one molecule to make a good perfume? We should have known it. Why so many compounds? The reason is, in a way, obvious. If there were only one compound that were responsible for the, uh, for the attraction of the male, then a simple mutation which would destroy the production of that compound would destroy the species. That's not how the world operates. And so by having a mixture of compounds, you allow some viability even when one molecule the most active one is destroyed. Anyway, I give you these examples. Oh, of course, they're fun. And the other thing that I hope you see is these are stories. They are chemical stories, but they are stories. And as Walter Benjamin has said, stories have an, are much more powerful than facts. They have a hold on our imagination. They should be used in teaching more. In these various examples, diversity is there. It makes a difference. But diversity is gradually achieved. It becomes clear that conservation of qualities is valued, must be valued. So there is a reason for the cultural conservatism of human societies. But diversity is also needed. Let's move upscale to biology. Uh, first of all, sex is a marvelous invention for conservation of inherited qualities and for the introduction in measure, but with certainty, of variation in them. More generally, speciation, the formation of species, involves a similar mix of conservative and adventurous or chanced aleatory qualities, a way to have variation among individuals and a gradation of evolutionary niches, of conditions to adjust to. And at the same time, speciation requires isolation, geographical or otherwise, and it requires time measured on the biological reproductive clock to adjust in a sequence of small changes to the environment. Now, human beings can speed up the change. Here is what we have done in 15, only 15,000 to 35,000 years in the evolution of a species coexistent with us, the domesticated dog. We have changed it. They are not several species, but they're on the way to becoming them. A timely concern in our time is species extinction. 
we appear to be heading for the greatest extinction in the geological history of the Earth. Not the first one. There have been at least five identifiable ones. But this is the one that's caused by human beings. We who are supposedly the pinnacle of evolution. Let me show you a paper that's just been published. Um, and I will read it because many of you cannot read the print there. Uh, it doesn't even have a page number. It's Proceedings National Academy of Science from Paul Ehrlich's group. And he says, we find that the rate of population loss in terrestrial vertebrates is extremely high. In our sample, comprising nearly half of the known vertebrate species, this is a large-scale study, 32% are decreasing in range and, and size. In the 177 mammals for which we have de detailed data, all have lost part of their diversity and range. And had experienced severe population declines. The maps below, the blue is the part where there's more than 70% loss of range or decline in general. <coughs> to extinguish a species is the equivalent of finding a library that had not been found before. The library is that of the compounds in that species, which differ from other compounds on Earth. To find that library and to burn it before reading it. A contrary view, there is a contrary view, even on species extinction. There is a substantial body of evidence that shows actually that species are increasing by hybridization. Here is an article in Nature, a letter in Nature, uh, looking at uh, Britain and looking an, at plants and sh showing that there are five species that have been introduced in modern times uh, from foreign and that have hybridized with natural species and have become established their own breeding populations. And the people writing this and uh, have uh, a point of view that actually the rate of species formation due to both what we normally think is not good, and that is invasive species brought from somewhere else, and also due to our introduction of new habitats in cities and in urban climates that actually this increases the species formation. There are divided opinions. The practitioners of science, I call them the tillers in the field of curiosity. Science, as it took shape in Europe from the Enlightenment, had middle-class aristocratic roots. It developed a meritocracy in time that crossed class lines, yet it remained largely male and white. With few exceptions, science excluded women, Africans, Jews, and Asians. There were not good ones among them, it was said. Or people said they were temperamentally or constitutionally unable, unsuited to do science. Though some natural philosophers marched in movements to abolish slavery and absolute monarchy and empower women, most followed quietly the society that supported them. How could that be? Aren't scientists supposed to be more rational than other human beings? No, scientists are human, and they are embedded in the social systems that shape them. The facts speak for themselves. In the time of Liebig and Hoffmann, when the first German chemical society was formed, science was a male and white system. So how far have we come today? There has been a tremendous growth in the number of women in the physical sciences. Here are some statistics from the United States. From a low base of about 5% of PhDs, there is a rise in 20 years 
uh, in 19, 19, 20 years ago to about 25%. The figure today is around 40%. What about Germany? So this is again not visible, so I'll tell you what it is. Uh, so uh, if, first of all, even without any statistics, if 30, 40 years ago, you asked what countries were worst in the world in getting women into science. Germany, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan would have headed the list. Uh, now, actually, that is supported by statistics. Statistics come here from the European community. If there is one thing the European community is good at, it's gathering statistics, <laughs> much to the trouble of many of you who have to fill out those forms. Anyway, here is, this is a table which I obtained thanks to Uta Zibel and Barbara Albert of uh, PhDs granted in 2004 and 2012, the percentages. And if you, were, if you can read the little box, which is for Germany, in 2004 it was 22% and was the lowest in Europe. Uh, and then, by 2012, it advanced to 33%, which was now only a few percent below the European average. That looks pretty good. It is very good for eight years. Situation, though, is not very good overall. Here is another graph you can't see, but I'll tell you what's in it. In the one at left, it lists uh, what it lists is the number of women in research positions in general. And it lists them by country. And you can see where I've put the box. That's Germany. This is 2012. And it's pretty near the bottom. Uh, the other graph at right is the number of women researchers in industrial positions. And again, now the small number is not good. And you see Germany a second from the smallest there. Now, the situation is in some, the pipeline is filling. We have seen the number of PhDs grown, growing from 22 to 33 percent, an incredible rise for eight years. The pipeline is growing, but it's very slow. For this purpose, I could have chosen a graph about Germany, but the graphs for every other country look the same. So what this is, it's a graph where uh, the dark blue is women, the light blue is men, and it's the percentage at various stages of education. Starts out at left with um, bachelors, goes on to a PhD in the middle, and then goes on to university appointments, and the right hand most point is above senior lecturer. Why does it say senior lecturer? Because it happens that these statistics are for Australia, OK? Uh, the statistics for Germany look exactly the same. They look exactly the same for the United States. There are no good actors here in this. In this. Now, the pipeline is filling. And not only, the, not only are there more women but also in science, but it takes 20 or 30 years to go from the left side of this graph to the right side of this graph. So what one is hopeful is that it will change with time. I don't want to end on, any, on a negative row uh, position here. Here is some, actually some statistics which Alina Gaida from the uh, Deutsche Chemische Gesellschaft has given to me. One is the number of PhDs of women, but the graph is more telling. It is the number of women professors in Germany uh, with growing over a period of from 2004 to 2016. So this is a more recent graph. And it is, it is promising in what it, has, what it points out. OK, we have to look a little bit beyond this. Let's go back to the diversity. So, we need to move, I move from chemists to bio, chemistry to biology. We need to move to human beings. And what we're talking about is the value of diversity. So this question of the value of diversity, the prevalence and the value, 
are very much the subject of interest to people in business schools, schools of industrial relations, sociology departments. Any workplace is a mixture of people, and what they want to do is to find the best conditions under which a group of people perforce diverse functions. So it is social scientists who have studied this. And I want to show you just two of the studies, one positive and one a little bit negative. So here, the next one shows, this is very, this takes time to explain, I might as well explain it, rather than you trying to read it. So it's a study by Levine and Stark, published three years ago. So they were studying the formation of price bubbles in economic trading on the stock exchange. Price bubbles occur when people make the wrong judgment and overvalue a stock. Okay, and then eventually it falls down. So this evaluation of the stock is done in trading, it involves judgments. So what they did was they formed two communities of traders, which were trading stocks. One community in North America and one in Singapore. And they included in the communities three different ethnic groups. Of course, in Singapore, these were Chinese, Indians, and Malayans. In the United States, it happened they chose whites, African Americans, and Latinos. One could have chosen something else. Then what they did is within each group of about 100 people, they formed little groups of traders, five to 10 people, who decided on the pricing of a stock of whether to buy it or to sell it. And in one case, they formed the groups homogeneously, so they were all Chinese in Hong Kong, all Indians. And in the other case, they mixed up people. And then they looked over their performance after a few months. And the numbers here, uh, which you cannot see, show that the diverse groups uh, had a 50% better chance of uh, valuing the stock properly, of trading in a rational way. And the, ah, what's the explanation? Uh, the explanation, this is not the usual kind of science, but the explanation that they tried to establish also by questionnaires and by following the discussions within the trading groups was that the, in the homogeneous group, people tended to defer to a assumed leader in the group, and they all did the same thing. Whereas in the diverse groups, there was a built-in mechanism to say something opposite, to say something different, to disagree, and that this formed the reason for the success of the diverse groups. Not everything in the social science studies is positive. Here is a study of 30,000 people in the United States of diversity by a leading Harvard sociologist. And what he said, in the long run, immigration diversity are likely to have important cultural, economic, and fiscal development benefits. In the short run, however, immigration and ethnic diversity tend to reduce social solidarity and social capital. That's a, uh, that's a sociologist's word. Uh, new evidence from the US suggests that in ethnically diverse neighborhoods, residents of all races tend to hunker down, the piece of slang, trust, even of one's own group, is lower, altruism and community cooperation rarer, friends fewer. This work has been criticized, but there are a number of studies which indicate that there are problems in diversity in groups of human beings. Friends, I am not a romantic fool in search of a chemical or biological or management argument for the benefits of the, the accruing to you of admitting a million refugees. The same or not the same is one of the creative tensions of this world, whether it is of molecules or of people. 
a culture, a language, a species could not come into being, evolve without sequestration, without geographic isolation. And it would never have the chance of becoming one if there was not distinction or contrast. Even as I value conservation and continuity, I will argue for diversity, especially in the human realm. Here is what I see in diversity. I see a path to a better balance of self, others, and society. Let me explain a little bit. Multiculturalism helps us to understand people so that we can work more productively together. When we try to translate a text or a phrase from uh, our native language into a language we are learning just, we uh, begin to understand, um, the, really understand the plight that an immigrant feels in a country when they cannot express humor when they cannot express their humanity in some way. Even in chemistry, I think part of the success of American graduate education are open group meetings in chemistry, where people, where you hear different opinions and someone says, this paper is lousy. This is a paper that's been supported by the National Science Foundation that appears in Angevante Chemie. And still it can be a poor paper. That kind of diversity, which is what goes on in group meetings, if it's encouraged by the professor, is part of what makes that educational function. Uh, it gives you a better sense for what others do. Second, for the country, your country, my country, an immense enrichment in the workforce follows from immigration, from diversity. For chemistry, the entrance of women into first-class research in universities and elsewhere, in some ways may have saved the profession, as men have gone on to what? To business schools or somewhere else. Um, chemistry has benefited tremendously. The third thing is that cultural and ethnic diversity just enriches life in many ways. It gains us variety in the choices we make. It gives us a different point of view. Science becomes just plain more fun, I think with our diverse research groups. In the end, there is my own experience only. If you have followed my work, you will have seen that I made transitions from inorganic to organic, back to inorganic and organometallic to surface and solid state. And more recently, I've entered the fields of material matter under high pressure of electrodes, of singlet fission, of the transmission of current across molecules. I, I didn't plan those directions. It's true that I was operating in a system which gave me the freedom to follow my nose, but actually I was led into these fields by the more than 200 postdocs and near 50 graduate students who've worked with me over the years. And I profited tremendously from that diversity. I want to talk to you about refuge. America took in my family and me as refugees from wartime Europe. Not easily. There were, there were restrictive immigration laws. It took four years in displaced persons 
camps to get there. But after we came, I and thousands more of Hitler's gifts to America have served the USA well. In my case, through teaching to thousands and through my research, indirectly enabling the applied science that others have done to improve the human condition. Germany has accepted a million, over a million refugees in the last five years. Seekers of asylum, victims of persecution from war-torn Syria, Iraq, other areas of conflict. Your welcome of these refugees has touched everyone in the world. It took courage, human courage, that had to be translated into political courage to do this. It will take so much more than money. It will take goodwill, empathy, and patience for those immigrants, young and old, to be integrated into German society. The diversity you will gain, just as the diversity America gained, I think one day will pay you amply back for your country's faith in humanity. On the 200th anniversary of the GDCH, there will be, I am sure, Plenary speakers whose name will be Yilmaz or Simonetta or Ioannidis or Alkuri, and they will be German. May the diversity you have chosen brighten the next 150 years of the German Chemical Society. Thank you. <laughs>